Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to this video in our series on A-Level Economics. Topics covered today are as follows. 2.4 National Income If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Looking at national income, the first thing we need to look at is the circular flow of income. The most basic form of the model shows a two-sector economy, with just the households and the sellers. Households own all the wealth and resources so provide the firms with land, labor and capital in return for rent, wages, interest and profits. They use this money to buy goods and services produced by the firms. Money, represented by the green arrows, flows in one direction and goods, services and factors of production, shown by orange arrows, flow in another. In this model, there are three ways of measuring the level of economic activity. The national output, the value of the flow of goods and services from firms to households, the national expenditure, the value of spending by households on goods and services, and the national income, of income paid by firms to households in return for land, labor, capital and enterprise. In this simple model, the national output equals national expenditure, which equals national income. However, the two-sector model is too simplified to represent the actual economy. Firstly, the government needs to be added, they take money out of the economy through taxation, shown by T, and add money by spending, shown by G. If the government spends more than it takes away, it can increase the flow of income. Next, we add to the model by introducing financial services that can inject money into the system through investment, shown by I, and take money away when consumers or producers save, shown by S. Finally, foreign markets are added as foreigners buy British goods so exports, shown by X, add money to the flow but British people want to buy foreign goods so imports, shown by M, take money away from the flow. The difference between the level of imports and exports is the balance of trade. Now, let's look at income and wealth. Wealth is a stock of assets whilst income is a flow. Wealth is the things people own, for example, houses and possessions, whilst income is the money they receive, for example, money from work and interest from savings. Countries with high levels of wealth tend to have high levels of income and vice versa but there is not a perfect correlation between wealth and income. Let's look at the injections and withdrawals. Firstly, injections are monetary additions to the economy. 1. Government spending. 2. Investment. 3. Exports. Secondly, withdrawals or leakages are where money is removed from the economy. 1. Taxes. 2. Savings. 3. Imports. If the sum of injections is greater than the sum of leakages or withdrawals, then the economy will be growing whilst if injections are smaller than withdrawals, it will be shrinking. In an equilibrium, injections must be equal to withdrawals and so the national income remains the same. So, what are the equilibrium levels of real national output? The equilibrium position of national output is where the aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves intersect. If either aggregate supply or aggregate demand is shifted, then the equilibrium position will change. The size of this change will depend on the size of the shift and the elasticity of the curve which has not moved, for instance, the elasticity of aggregate supply if aggregate demand has moved. Firstly, let's look at the short term. Both Keynesian and classical economists agree that in the short run aggregate demand will be downward sloping and aggregate supply will be upward sloping. In this diagram, the initial equilibrium level is P1Y1, where AD1 and SRAS1 intersect. However, the increase in short run aggregate supply to SRAS2 has changed the equilibrium position to P2Y2. There has been a fall in the price level and an increase in real GDP. A decrease in short run aggregate supply would lead to higher prices and lower real GDP. In this new diagram, 
The initial equilibrium level is P1Y1 where AD1 equals SRAS1. The increase in the aggregate demand curve to AD2 has led to a change in equilibrium to P2Y2. Prices and real GDP are higher. A fall in aggregate demand would lead to lower prices and lower real GDP. Next, the long term. This is where Keynesian and classical economists don't agree so much. Firstly, classical long-run aggregate supply. As the classical long-run aggregate supply curve is perfectly inelastic, for instance, a change in price has no effect on change in output, a shift of the aggregate demand curve would not affect long-run national output and would only affect price levels. Classical economists believe that the economy will always return to full employment level and therefore there will be no unemployment in the long run. They believe that the increase in aggregate demand from AD1 to AD2 will lead to a positive output gap. The economy is in long-term disequilibrium as SRAS1 and AD2 do not intersect on the long-run aggregate demand curve. The short-term equilibrium is P2Y2. This means that there is over full employment and firms will end up bidding up wages of labor, as each of them offers a higher salary in order to attract the best workers and the other factor prices. As a result, the short-run aggregate supply shifts to SRAS2 as the cost of production has increased. Eventually, the economy is producing the same amount but now at higher prices. They are producing at Y1P3. The short-run equilibrium has shifted and is now the same as the long-run equilibrium. Classicists conclude that an increase in aggregate demand will increase price and output in the short run but over time, prices will continue to rise as the economy moves back to the long-term equilibrium. Therefore, output has not changed and the only way to increase output is by increasing the long-run aggregate supply. Changes in aggregate demand without a change in the long-run aggregate supply are only inflationary. The initial equilibrium is where AD1 equals LRAS1 at P1Y1. The increase in long-run aggregate supply, from LRAS1 to LRAS2, has caused lower prices and higher output, at P2Y2. Although there is short-term disequilibrium, as SRAS1 does not intersect the curve at this point, they believe this will be closed by a shift in short-run aggregate supply. A rise in long-run aggregate supply is likely to lead to lower prices and higher output. When this is compared to a rise in aggregate demand which causes increased prices and no higher output, it is clear to see why classical economists favor supply-side policies over demand management. Secondly, a Keynesian view of long-run aggregate supply. Keynesian economists agree with classicists that there is full employment where the long-run aggregate supply is vertical. However, they believe there can be equilibrium at less than full employment, or where the curve is horizontal. This is because they don't believe that a rise in unemployment rapidly leads to a fall in real wages. Keynesians would agree with classicists that a shift from AD3 to AD4 is purely inflationary and would only increase price not output, as equilibrium point changes from P2Y3 to P3Y3. However, they believe if the economy is in a deep recession then an increase from AD1 to AD2 is the opposite and only increases output not price. The equilibrium changes from P1Y1 to P1Y2. A shift of any aggregate demand curve to or from AD5 would lead to a change both in price and equilibrium. With a Keynesian curve, the impact of a shift in aggregate demand strongly depends on the elasticity of the curve, and hence whether the economy is at or near full employment. If the economy is producing at or near full employment, for example at AD1, then a rise in long-run aggregate supply will increase output and decrease the price level. This is seen by the change in equilibrium from P1Y1 to P2Y2 following the shift. However, if the economy is in a deep recession, for example producing at AD2, then an increase in long-run aggregate supply will have no effect on prices or output. This is shown by the fact the equilibrium is still at P3Y3. This is why Keynesians argue that during recessions the government needs to work to increase aggregate demand rather than using supply-side policies. Let's look at increasing aggregate demand and supply. In microeconomics, any factor which affected demand would not affect supply and vice versa. However, with macroeconomics, a factor that affects aggregate demand can easily affect aggregate supply. One example of this could be an investment. 
Investment is a component of aggregate demand so an increase in investment will increase aggregate demand but it could also increase long run aggregate supply as firms are able to produce more if they have more machines. This may mean that the long run disequilibrium caused by the shift in aggregate demand will be brought back to equilibrium by an increase in long run aggregate supply rather than a fall in aggregate demand. However, not all investment results in increased production. For example, a firm may invest but then go out of business. and so the long run aggregate supply will not increase therefore the extent to which investment increases output and lessens inflation depends on its rate of return moving on the multiplier effect firstly the multiplier process and ratio the multiplier process is the idea that an increase in aggregate demand because of an increased injection for example exports government spending or investment can lead to a further increase in national income. It is the ratio of the final change in income to the initial change in injection and the figure multiplied by the original injection to find the final change in income. The initial injection will represent an increase in spending and will increase income for someone else which will then lead to further consumption spending. For example, if the government spends 100 million pounds to create jobs and withdrawals are taken into account, the 100 million of government spending could lead to an extra 90 million pounds being spent by those who have the jobs of which another 81 million will be spent by those who receive the 90 million and so on in this case the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9 and the multiplier is 10 the extra consumption creates more jobs and increases output the size of the multiplier will be determined by how much of an increase in income people will spend the marginal propensity to consume or mpc The lower the leakage is, the higher the MPC, the bigger the multiplier. The multiplier is able to work due to the concept of circular flow since one person's spending is another's income. The IMF has calculated that in developed countries, the multiplier tends to be around 1.5 in the long run and about 1.6 for developing countries. A negative multiplier effect can also occur i.e. a withdrawal from the economy could lead to an even further fall in income, decreasing economic growth and possibly leading to a decline in the economy. This means that government plans to cut deficits will lead to an even further decrease in the economy. What are the effects of the multiplier on the economy? The multiplier means that growth can occur quickly as any injections lead to a bigger increase in national income. Injections can be targeted at those with the biggest MPC in order to increase the size of the multiplier. For example, if the government is trying to stimulate the economy, they will want to give more money to people with the highest MPC, those being people on low incomes. Governments use changes in spending to influence macroeconomic performance, but it is impossible for the government to know the exact effect of their spending as it is difficult to know the size of the multiplier. As with many things in macroeconomics, there will also be a time lag between the increase in income and the full effect of that increase as not everyone will spend the money straight away. The overall effect on the economy will depend on the change in aggregate demand and the elasticity of the aggregate supply curve. What are some definitions and effects of marginal propensities? Marginal propensity to consume or MPC This is the increase in consumption following an increase in income. Marginal propensity to save or MPS. This is the increase in savings following an increase in income. Marginal propensity to tax or MPT. This is the increase in taxation following an increase in income. Marginal propensity to import or MPM. This is the increase in imports following an increase in income. marginal propensity to withdraw or mpw this is the increase in leakages following an increase in income mpw will equal mps plus mpt plus npm the multiplier is dependent on mpc and so can change all the time mpc depends on a range of factors any factor that affects consumption as a component of aggregate demand will affect the mpc for example a change in interest rates will affect the mpc The higher the MPC, the bigger the multiplier is. This means more money of income is spent so more money is transferred through the circular flow and less is withdrawn. The other marginal propensities show how much of a change in income is withdrawn from the economy. For example, how much is not spent. An increase in any of these will decrease the MPC. 
A change in tax will affect MPC, Caterus Paribus, as it will increase the MPT any factor other than income that affects imports, for example, the quality of imported goods will affect MPM and therefore MPC. What are the effects of a change in aggregate demand? The multiplier leads to an increase in aggregate demand higher than the original increase but for it to have the desired effect, there must be sufficient spare capacity in the economy, for example, it cannot be at full output for extra output to be produced. If the aggregate supply is perfectly inelastic, like on the classical long-run aggregate supply curve, then the only impact of the multiplier will be to increase the price. It will not affect output in the long run, although it will in the short run. The more elastic the curve, the smaller the effect on price but the bigger the effect on output. Therefore, as with any increase in aggregate demand, the effect of the multiplier depends on the shape of the aggregate supply curve and whether it is short run or long run. The size of the increase in aggregate demand will depend on both the size of the initial increase in aggregate demand and the size of the multiplier. In general, the multiplier will have a big effect when there is plenty of spare capacity in the economy and the MPW is low, or, MPC is higher. It has little effect on output when there is little spare capacity in the economy so the rising demand only creates rising prices. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share. And comment below so we can clarify things for you.